All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank everyone for being here with us this morning. I'm Valerie Doyle. I'm the 2017 chair of the Austin Board of Realtors Foundation. And we, I'm going to look at my notes really quick because yesterday I spent all day building our habitat build. So ordinarily I would have this all memorized, but today is, I'm a little, a uh, little foggy. So as we all know, this past fall, Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria left behind a path of destruction, um, if, destruction to personal property affecting thousands of people and homeowners, renters alike. And frequently those displaced homeowners and renters turn to their real estate professional to seek guidance and to look for a path forward on how to um, surmount, you know, overcome the, the destruction that was left behind. And so today the uh, Foundation Forum Task Force has assembled um, an expert moderator who we'll introduce in just a little bit and panelists. Um, ranging a broad spectrum of real estate related issues and, and how disasters affect their particular line of business. But before we begin today, I want to introduce our sponsor. Um, it's Ms. Tyka Booker from United Health Advisors, who is an ABOR Forum affiliate sponsor for today's event. She's going to speak to us for just a minute, and I believe she has a drawing. So if you haven't put your business card in the, the box at the front, I can, if you hold them up, I can collect them, and we'll do that at the end of her talk. You don't need a microphone? I don't need the microphone. Tyka does not need the microphone. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tyka Booker. I work with U.S. Health Advisors, and I work through um, National Association of Self-Employed as well. So what I do is I provide health insurance options uh, outside of the marketplace. So people that don't qualify for uh, ACA, folks that are frustrated with paying huge premiums and huge deductibles, um, you're healthy and you'll never uh, meet the deductibles to use the access or use the benefits under your plan. Uh, we are in open enrollment right now, and folks need to make a selection before December 15th. Or policies to start January 1st. Um, if you are looking for someone to review those options for you, um, we only provide PPO, the largest PPO provider uh, in the state of Texas. I'm licensed in 30 states, so I have thousands of clients all over. Um, the network that we work through is through Cigna. Um, so if you are in the, the midst of major changes, you've received a letter that your benefits will be canceled, or you've received a letter of your rate uh, increasing, um, I have an opportunity to help you. We typically can save you about 25 to 40 percent on your uh, monthly premiums. Um, we help folks that are self-employed, small business owners, individuals, and families. Um, once again, my name is Tyka Booker, U.S. Health Advisor. I'm located in Cedar Park. Um, and all you need to do is answer some questions for me. I uh, will present the policy to you. I fill out all your paperwork and manage your policy as long as you have it in place. Um, so it's very different from uh, if you had to take care of your health insurance yourself, um, because ultimately that's my job to take care of that for you. Uh, so I will leave some cards in the back of the room. Uh, feel free to send me a text message, email. Uh, my web um, agent site is on there as well. Thank you so much for your time this morning. And we have a drawing for lunch for at the Longhorn Steakhouse. Let's see. Let's see. Lynn Wilkinson. Oh, All right, thank you, Tyka and United Health Advisors. Without the strong support of affiliates like you, we would not be able to put on the great information program that we have this morning. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to recognize the Austin Board of Realtors Foundation Board of Directors and our incoming directors. If you're a director of the foundation, would you please stand and be recognized? Or an incoming uh, director? Thank you so much. All right, and as we know, there's lots of leadership represented in this room. I'd also like to recognize any ABOR board of directors or any incoming directors. If you're a director, of, thank you so much. What about NAR directors? Do we have any, any NAR directors here today? I was going to say, I believe our uh, moderator is an NAR director, so thank you for your leadership and your service. And I'm, I'm getting to that. And I'm going to believe that she's going to raise her hand for this one also. A TAR director? Is anyone here a TAR director? Um, and, okay, this is a new one for me, an RVP. I don't even know what that is. It's a regional but, vice president. Are you a regional vice president. Okay, well, again, I was building a house yesterday. Um, tree pack. <laughs> Are there any tree pack directors here? I know there are. I know one of our panelists is, as a matter of fact. So thank you. Um, 
and, and PAR executive leadership. I believe I did see one today. Thank you, thank you. He's not standing, but he's here in the room. But anyway, so clearly, you know, things like this take leadership. ABOR takes leadership. We thank all of you for, for giving your time and for helping us out today. Speaking of leadership, I'd like to introduce Ms. Diane Kennedy. She is going to be 2018 chair of the Austin Board of Realtors Foundation, and she's going to take a few minutes to talk to you about the foundation and the works that we do. Good morning. So um, I am really happy to be representing the philanthropic arm of the Austin Board of Realtors with the foundation. I do feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir because when I look out here, I see so many of you who are already so involved. But <laughs> I'm going to go through this just for the, for the few that may be uh, new to what the foundation does and how we do it. Um, I want, just want to give you a quick reminder of where the dollars we raise go each year. And uh, as you've probably figured out, we're in the middle of our Habitat Blitz build, um, which we do every year. We are now on our fifth home. So um, we, the Austin Board of Realtors is responsible for providing, up to now, five families with homes, families who would not have had an opportunity to own a home um, without Habitat and ABOR's involvement with Habitat. So uh, we're really, really happy. There's, um, there's still time to sign up. Um, I'll be there all day tomorrow with about 30 others, and uh, we will be doing this. The, the sign-up sheet is still on the uh, ABOR homepage. So if you want to come and see what it's all about, um, I promise you that uh, it's a very, very rewarding experience and you may pick up some new skills. Uh, I'm pretty mean with a nail gun right now. So <laughs> my skill from last year, I don't know what my skill set from this year is going to be, but it's always exciting. Um, we also partnered with the Red Cross uh, and we're honored to be uh, named their Public Partner of the Year. In 2017, we donated to the Austin disaster relief efforts after Harvey. We partnered with uh, the SWBC Mortgage and Amley uh, Residential. We raised over $7,500 in support of family elder care for their summer fan drive. Uh, that's a lot of box fans, I've got to tell you. Um, we're partnering, uh, have partnered during the year, and we are partnering right now uh, with Front Steps, providing housewares and small appliances to the homeless that are transitioning into a new independent um, lifestyle and permanent housing. Um, you probably saw the table stacked with crock pots and toasters and that kind of thing out there. Um, if you want to make a donation, you can bring that to... Um, any of the ABOR facilities uh, through the 11th, I believe. We've been working with Rebuilding Together Austin. I know some of you, a lot of you, have joined in that effort in the past. Um, it's, um, again, very rewarding to help homeowners. These are particularly people who are at risk of losing their homes due to health and safety issues. So this past year, um, was a, uh, an elderly widow who had a disabled daughter, and her home was in such disrepair that she was being declined for insurance. Um, so about 50 volunteers went in, spent the day, and brought her home up to standards that would allow her to get insurance. And Ted's going to tell us how important having insurance on your home is. Um, <laughs> Every year we award uh, scholarships to seniors in the local area to, that are going on to Texas colleges. This past year we awarded 17 scholarships. Uh, and that's a, a growing effort as we get the funds. Um, we've also contributed to the efforts of foundation communities, uh, again, helping homeless people um, transition and, and uh, put, put back together their lives from whatever past experiences they've had. And most of you are familiar with Foundation Communities. Walter Moreau was our 
worthy, most worthy citizen um, this past year, and he's the one that runs that uh, runs that group. Um, and then, um, last but not least, we are uh, in the process of collecting funds, and we have already um, made a commitment to donate to two of our sister associations that suffered suffered tragically during the during the storm. So we're going to be making donations to the Beaumont Association of Realtors and the Puerto Rico Association of Realtors. Um, so if anybody wants to donate to those specifically, you can just let us know that that's where you want your money to go. And we'll make sure that that happens. Um, now, uh, where does the money for all of these endeavors come from? It comes from you. All of you, I hope, all of you. Um, your donations at our fundraising events like Most Worthy Citizen, uh, the Mercedes raffle that we just had at Realty Roundup, and most importantly, the easiest is the dues billing that's going on right this minute. Starting November 15th, you've got until December 15th to pay your dues. There's a little box on there, and in case you've never heard this before, please don't uncheck the box. <laughs> That $10, with the $10 that your peers give, grows tenfold to enable us in our efforts with the, with the foundation. Why do we do this? We, the volunteers with the foundation and the people that volunteer in all of these efforts, are working every day to make realtors in our community look good and to give you the bragging rights that you can use with your, with your customers so that they know how involved you are in the, in the community and how that comes back to help, help them in the long run. So one of the foundation's cornerstone initiatives uh, is the, the uh, resource for the community in the event of national, uh, sorry, natural disasters. So I'm gonna have Valerie come back and provide an update on that. All right, so as you know, Hurricane Harvey was one of the worst national disasters Houston and the Texas Gulf Coast has ever experienced. Hurricane Irma and Maria um, also left devastation in their wake. To wrap your head around the scope of the storms, I visited with our liaison at the American Red Cross Central Texas, and they reported that over the past three months, the Red Cross has had over 1.3 million overnight stays as a result of the hurricanes, and that is more than the previous five years combined. They have served 8.6 million meals, which is more than the previous four years combined. They distributed 5.7 million in emergency relief items, ranging from cleanup kits and glasses to prescription medicine and mental health services. Um, they have so far distributed over $229 million in disaster relief to affected homeowners and renters. There are more people waiting to receive funds. They anticipate that the long-term recovery team will be working for years to fully address the, the needs caused by these three hurricanes. So here in Central Texas, we're not likely to see the type of devastation that comes from hurricanes, but Texas is, Central Texas is <laughs> immune to disasters. Um, it's estimated that the Bastrop fires affected 1,645 homes re, um, several years back, and the National Weather Service has named Central Texas as the most flash flood prone region in North America. Most recently, the Austin area experienced the 2013 Halloween Onion Creek floods and the 2015 Memorial Day floods, each one affecting thousands of homes and the people who live there. So what do we do when disaster strikes? Our Foundation Forum Task Force has assembled this panel, and I'm pleased to introduce our moderator. She comes well versed in this subject. She's Ms. Shally Ralph from the Houston area. She's the president of the Heritage Texas Properties. She is a past chair of the Houston Association of Realtors and serves as a regional vice president. Oh, that's where that yeah. RFP yeah. comes in. <laughs> um, of the Texas Association of Realtors. And, and she is a director, our current director of the National Association of Realtors. 
Earlier this month, she hosted her own panel on the same topic in Houston. We feel she's really well-versed to um, lead this important discussion. Um, she's going to be introducing our panelists in just a moment. Uh, we have a set of questions that, that we have come up with. Hopefully at the end, if you have additional questions that haven't been answered in the panel discussion, we hope to have some time at the end that you can ask your own question. But for now, I'll turn it over to Shally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Is this on? <laughs> Hello? It's on? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here. Um, I, as she said, I'm, I'm, I have firsthand knowledge of Harvey. Um, we, um, it, I was one of the few um, in my company, actually, that was not impacted by Harvey. We have about 375 agents and about 100 employees, and about 40-plus 40, 40 people were affected in some form or fashion. Uh, which was about 10% of our company, which we pretty much heard across the, the greater Houston area. It was about 10% of Houston and the greater Houston area that was affected. So uh, we fell right in line with the norm there. Um, the three things that I remember initially that I'll just share with you before we start our panel was one of our uh, brokers that's a partner of ours in New Orleans came over immediately, and one of the things they told us was to breathe. And I thought, what a great piece of advice for all of us in any type of disaster, just to breathe and to remember that we have short-term memories. And interestingly enough, we, when you think of Houston and you think um, the past storm we thought of was Allison, which was in 2001, and people don't think about Allison anymore, and for years we haven't thought about it. So we do have short-term memories, and it will pass. And then two, the third thing was, first and foremost, uh, that you're going to be in a world of change for a long period of time. And so I think we're all still adjusting to that. So I'm going to let each of our panel members introduce themselves, and we look forward to hearing from them as well. Francois, do you want to begin? Okay. My name is Francois Newkirk. The name of my company is Texas Tryout and Restoration. I'm a general contractor, and I happen to specialize in mold remediation. Hello, I'm Ted Heaton with State Farm Insurance. Thanks for having me. Most of y'all know who I am and have probably heard my spiel before. I can't imagine what that forum was like in Houston. I mean, I bet that was a little bit wild and raucous, almost it's, like let's make it's a been deal. It's interesting. Um, uh, and I'm here today uh, to, to answer a few, as many questions about flood insurance and FEMA that I can. Good morning. My name's Roland Love. Is that on? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm the uh, president for North American Title Company in Texas. Uh, we have offices here in Austin, but we also have half a dozen offices down in Houston. So. We dealt with that firsthand, and I'm looking forward to visiting with you. All right, I'm Scott Lucas. Uh, I'm a Texas uh, General Certified Real Estate Appraiser and a designated member of the Appraisal Institute. Um, my boss, Rudy Robinson, who some of you might have run into at some point, um, we specialize in appraising properties with all sorts of legal and physical conditions, um, <laughs> including environmental contamination, construction defects, and also properties uh, affected by natural disasters. I'm Tom Horn. I'm the uh, branch manager and uh, sales manager for Mid-America Mortgage in Cedar Park. I've uh, been in the business a long time. I've seen many disasters. We've been on the servicing end, so we do have some uh, insight as to what a servicer does for uh, when you encounter an unfortunate disaster. Good morning, my name is Bill Evans. I'm a real estate broker here in Austin. I'm one of your colleagues. I'm a, I'm a, um, my company specializes in leasing and property management, so I'm just here to help provide a 30,000 foot view <laughs> or an overview of what landlords and tenants might be required to consider when a natural disaster happens. Great. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I jokingly said they couldn't find a female up here, so they had to bring me in from Houston. I mean, what's the deal here? Um, so... HR! <laughs> so, um, and having... For, First-hand experience with Harvey, um, this question, you know, you know, it's certainly an excellent one, and it's who do I call first if I'm in a disaster? Anybody want to address that? You know, I, I'll take that one. You can call me <laughs> uh, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get called. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the, the first things that, you know, that you've experienced and people that have 
um, you know, dealt with the Wimberley or the Memorial Day floods is, you know, you know, what the hell do I do first? Uh, so uh, insurance companies, you, you can call my, you can call your insurance agent's office and they're, if they're not open, there's generally an 800 number. But remember that those people in the 800 number are sitting in a call center and they have a, you know, they have a script that, you know, they go, they, they kind of go down. Okay, and in a lot of cases, the providers that they refer turn out to be really, really good, and in some cases, they suck. And so, you know, we always try in our office to, to be, you know, the, the first resource to get them, you know, the attention that they need just to try to get them moving in the right direction and, and get their mind around, you know, what's getting ready to happen. We have a rule in our office that we tell people the good news or the bad news as fast as we can when it's appropriate, okay? You know, so, you know, when there's six feet of water in somebody's house, yeah. you don't say this is gonna be a three-year project, right? You know, when you get them on the phone at, at first, but you, you already know that, so you try to take them into baby steps and then turn them over to a professional that can minimize, hopefully, save some of their stuff and minimize their issues. Let me add, if, if you have a pending transaction, I suspect the first person mm -hmm. they call is gonna be one of you. You're the realtor that's mm -hmm. been holding their hand. So um, if there, it's slightly different, but I agree. You wanna to get to the insurance company as soon as possible. It's gonna be a preliminary step to a FEMA application. So you've got to have done that. But if it's the realtor, you're gonna to want to be able to certainly communicate know your rights, empathize with them, immediately they're looking for some sense of safety, security, and then a plan. And, and you're, the, you're the plan giver, or at least you're gonna work through and empower them so they'll know what they can do next. We saw a lot of folks who felt basically hopeless. They didn't know mm -hmm. what to do next. And mm -hmm. I think that's where the realtor industry really came into play, helping give those people some guidance and point them in the right direction. Bill, did you have a comment? Or, sorry, go ahead. Disasterassistance.gov is on the FEMA website, mm -hmm. and that is a good resource because it'll list mm -hmm. the transitioning hotels where they can, where they can stay at, and they need to after they call the insurance, then they need to focus on on FEMA. And there's a lot of good uh, uh, information on. And you, don't have, you can go to FEMA and there's a link that is to the disasterassistance.gov. It's a really good, uh, and you should have knowledge of that so mm. in case they don't, you can share that. And that is an actual government website that is within FEMA. So I'll send Diane some of the links that we use with our clients. So when we get a flood client, we send out links. They've got some, you know, the, of, the, of the things that they've spent your money on, you know, some of the brochures and some of what they, uh, the information on their website is actually very good. And it tells people exactly what to do. And when, when we have a flood, we pull out one of those brochures and we go, number one, you know, take the necessary steps. Number two, pile everything in your front yard. The reason you see all that crap in the front yards is because if, the, if and when the adjuster shows up, that stuff is not piled up in the front yard, the people may not get paid for it. And that's why that mm -hmm. stuff has to stay there. Uh, so, uh, but I'll send that to Diane, uh, and she can pass that out for, uh, to y'all. How many? How many of y'all have actually seen a, a house that's been in a disaster flood? Quite a few. Mm -hmm. I had the unfortunate experience, or fortunate, depending on how you look at it, went down in the Grange where the water rose 60 feet, mm -hmm. and my and my my friend's house is up here and the creek was 60 feet down, still flooded his house up to above six foot in his house. Yeah. Yeah. Never flooded before. Mm -hmm. And so I actually I took my granddaughter down there and it was a very good experience for her to see that devastation. He had everything out in the front yard. The churches had come in, they, were, they took the, all the sheetrock off, they put everything out in the front yard and they were trying to, he was trying to salvage some of this and they kept telling them, you can't because the water is nasty. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it has uh, bacteria in mm -hmm. it. And, you know, it, it was just, if you haven't seen it, I mean, I hope, hope you don't have to, <laughs> but it, is, it was 
you really have to see that to really appreciate it, it the, how devastating it can be. The people live through, first they live through the event and they come to a conclusion that they're in bad shape. Then the water recedes and it's all piled up on one side of the house because you know where the water goes out, that's where everything piles up. And then they, they get a little boost of hope because they think, oh look, every, you know, everything's here. Well, mm -hmm. you know, 48 hours later, everything is there and it smells like hell. Okay, and you just can't save that stuff. Uh, and so, you know, the, it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions, uh, and and then they start talking to their neighbors, you know, and you got the neighbors that are the experts, right? And then you got the neighbors that don't have flood insurance, and then you got the neighbors that have their brother-in-law as a contractor, and then you got. Uh, you know the you know then you got to wait to hear from NFIP and then you got to wait to hear from the independent adjuster from NFIP, and folks, this is, it it is a traumatic experience that that unfortunately people continue to live through for a long period of time, and so it is it's a it's a huge huge uh, roller coaster. Yeah, Bill, did you have? I do. Um, and, and Landlords so far, and tenants. Everything we've heard from this distinguished panel is so reasonable and logical, don't you think? <laughs> but I'm telling you what, in my experience as a property manager, when, when a tenant is having and experiencing an emergency situation, the last thing they are is reasonable and they're not thinking logical. Mm -hmm. So if you're up to here with water, you want somebody to help you, and, and reason doesn't always come into the picture. Everybody in a landlord-tenant situation is in survival mode. And what we fail to ask, and communication is a big part of this, the tenants need to be trying their very best to communicate with the landlord, and the landlords need to be communicating with the tenants. And what they meant to say when the other person answered the phone was, are you okay? That's not what the first words that come out of their mouths are. The first words that come out of the landlord's mouth is, is my property okay? Is there still a roof? Did it flood? The first words I believe probably coming out of the tenant's mouths are, how did you let this happen? It was a hurricane, yeah. but it's the landlord's fault because there are landlords in this room who are at fault for everything that happens at that property. So what everybody needs to do first, I think, is communicate the best way you can, communicate with the landlord, tell them in a reasonable and calm fashion if you can because, you know, I've never experienced this, but I've seen it. Um, let them know you're okay. Let them know the situation of their property. The landlord should be giving some reassurance. There's all kinds of rules and regulations, and when you start quoting chapter 92 of the property code, the conversation <laughs> is only going to go downhill from there. Show a little empathy, be reasonable, and let everybody know you're okay. That's the main thing. Then we'll start talking about the who's and the what's and the why's. So. But right. you mean I'm not covered? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and all those conversations start to happen and questions start to come up. I think, an, I mean, just a good reminder is to call a professional, somebody that actually does it, you know, for a living, not asking the neighbors. Um, the joke around Houston for weeks and weeks after Harvey was Chuck in a truck. And um, so don't go with Chuck in a truck. I mean, everybody's going to knock on your door and put a card on your door and mm -hmm. tape something to your car or things like that. But, you know, just remember to call a professional and somebody you can know and trust and who knows what they're doing. Um, with that being said, um, I'm going to have a lot of expenses in a disaster. So do I pay my rent? Do I pay my mortgage? Or do I just hold on to that money because I'm going to have to move into a hotel? I guess that one's that one's for me. <laughs> um, the, the short answer on the uh, whether you have to pay your house payments are it's better if, if you can afford to do it, it's better to do it. The GSAs, which is the uh, government sponsored enterprise, which is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they allow you to do forbearance, which is, and they did it a lot recently. You can, you can go three months at a time, they'll give you up to 12 months forbearance. 
and uh, a lot of the people will, uh, if if they're if they can afford to pay their payments, great. If they can't, they need to communicate with their servicer, whoever they're paying their their mortgage to. In our case, it would be loan care. They would call loan care, and they would loan care would say, okay. They'd get all the necessary information, and then they would put them on a three-month variance and see how it goes from there. So no, they don't have to make their payments, but if they're able to, they can because just because it's forbearance doesn't mean it goes away. <laughs> and when the actual time comes, when they're whole again, they, uh, th they will have to, that balance that they for, that the, on the forbearance, they will have to pay that back sometime, but they don't, they don't make them, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, don't make them pay that balance back in full all at one time. So if they can pay it, great. If they can't, then they understand. They're going to go into forbearance. Any other comments on that, Rent? So I, I want to, you know, think about a landlord, an anonymous mm -hmm. landlord, and, and some of you in this room may be landlords with investment properties in Houston or Corpus or wherever it is. You have a mortgage on your dwelling in which you are living. You have a mortgage on a rental property, maybe more than one rental property. You depend perhaps on that rental income to pay the mortgages. And so you've got a tenant who's distressed and is not most likely going to pay the rent, but your mortgages are still due. So a landlord in these situations is, is getting hit twice or three times I don't know. They have to make the mortgage payment on their principal dwelling. They need to make mortgage payments on their rental properties, and they depend on that rental income to offset those expenses. So everybody is going to be stressed. There's a lot of stress mm -hmm. going around. So nobody is going to win. I don't care. Mm -hmm. If you have property damaged, whether you're a landlord or a tenant, you're not going to win. There was the joke. The opportunists are the people who are going to come in and, and try to collect some money for work they're not going to complete and you think you're doing the best thing you can. Nobody's in a, a good situation in this except for the opportunists who come in and try to take your money. Okay, to be clear, the flood insurance coverage does not cover, a flood insurance policy does not cover additional living expense slash loss of rents uh, on their policy. The flood insurance will only cover specific things. If you have a lawnmower, riding lawnmower sitting in your front yard and it gets washed away in a flood, that is not covered. If the riding lawnmower is in your garage and it gets damaged by the flood, it is covered. Okay? So, you know, the flood insurance, uh, so it let, let's also ver uh, clarify. We spend a lot of time in, in our office talking about jargon. So flood means water coming up from the ground into your house. If you have a water pipe leak that causes water damage in your house, that is a water pipe leak that causes damage in your house. That is not a flood. Okay? So the, the NFIP uh, policy guidelines do not account for additional living expense if the house floods. There can be situations where if the roof is blown off of a house and it flooded, that there could be some additional living expense in that and loss of rents in that case because of the wind blowing the roof off the house. Okay, but for, for the, from the standpoint of flood, uh, on renter's insurance and home insurance, it is not covered and under the NFIP policy, it is not covered. Any other comments? Go ahead. I might just add on the, on the lease issue, and maybe you can correct me on that or add to it. Um, this, the TAR contract or the lease agreement that I think a lot of folks use, it has a paragraph that deals with casualty loss, but it just kicks back mostly to Chapter 92. Um, <laughs> but if the property is not <laughs> habitable, then either party can terminate, if it wasn't caused by the tenant's error, the, either party can terminate that lease. 
So we saw a lot of that in Houston where people, do I have to pay my rent or can I vacate? Can I move somewhere else? You know, so the, the landlord has a right to make repairs and the tenant still has to pay their rent. But if it, if it can't be done in a reasonable amount of time and it's not habitable, actually the landlord may choose to, to terminate and has to give back the security deposit and the prorated rent. But um, the tenant can also terminate and, and move to other location, but only in those circumstances. This has to be really a totally unusable space, but we had that happen. Um, yeah, we had quite a few landlords who yeah. said they were terminating the lease, and the tenant said, we have nowhere to go, we want to stay, and the landlord said, no, you have to get out. This became a big issue, and, so. uh, whether they could force them to leave the property. And the last thing you want to do is advise somebody to live in a house that's got mold damage, you know, that's got yeah. mold damage or the potential. I mean, you know, there's still houses in Houston that haven't been treated yet mm -hmm. that you don't really know whether there's mold in it or not, okay? And, um, you know... Uh, Francois can can talk to this, but if, if you've ever seen a mold report, the first thing they do is they take the mold readings outside of the house, and then they go in the house and take the mold readings inside the house. And what's really funny here in Austin, there are some days that the mold readings outside the house are higher than the mold readings in the house, <laughs> e even after you know a water event. So welcome to Austin. Is that why when I come to Austin, my eyes turn red and my... I, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we... one, one, of the things, yeah, one of the things that most people miss is, is mitigating their damages. You must tell every single one of your clients they have to stop the problem from getting worse. It's in your insurance policy dictating that to you. Mitigate the damages and take plenty of documentation. Take pictures galore. Take far away mm -hmm. pictures so that you can see the whole lay mm -hmm. of the land and see how everything is sitting in there. Mm -hmm. And this way, the more pictures that you have, when an adjuster comes and says, well, gee, you had 24 pair of ostrich boots? Nobody's got 24 pair of ostrich boots. You go through pictures, and sure enough, you see them in a whole bunch of different pictures. The adjuster's going to say, okay, there's your documentation, mm -hmm. and they'll pay for it. So documentation is very, very important. Well, and, um, we, since we've kind of moved into the mold remediation, how does the remedi remediation team work with the insurance adjusters? <laughs> well, that's a battle. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that I'm sitting right next to Ted here. <laughs> Did y'all set yourselves up there? One of the things <laughs> that whoever you end up hiring there's a software estimating system that we use that they use as well. It's called Xactimate. It's very important that you get a detailed estimate from your contractor. This way he's gonna be able to justify what he's asking for from the adjuster. Can't just give him an eight and a half by 11 and say, give me $40,000 and I'll fix the house. I've been doing this for 35 years and I don't need you to tell me how to do my business. <laughs> Heard that one too. So through Xactimate, it, 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 you're able to tell them there's this many linear feet of baseboard, this many square feet of drywall, this many square feet of wall ceilings and floors, and here's everything that we're doing. So hiring a contractor that has the same software estimating system that most of your adjusters have is the first step. If you have a contractor that does not have it, then he does not want to know, know what he's going to be doing. Or to be able to justify the difference in the amount, my amount to fix the house might be three times the initial adjuster, but it's justification and being, being able to show that. So mm -hmm. here's a dilemma for you. So your property's now been remediated or repaired and somebody wants you to list it to sell, do you have to put that in your seller's disclosure notice? Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Yes, it should be disclosed. And then what do you have your inspector? If you're the buyer, you want to make sure the inspector looks to be sure it was done right. I think we're going to have a lot of that in Houston as the yeah. properties start coming back on the market. Some of them will have been handled correctly. Others will have been just patched. And let's be very clear since uh, the 2002 homeowners revolutionary change in the state of Texas, uh, you can get a proposal and you can look on that proposal and it'll say mold remediation, $5,000 you know, coverage. 
but then it'll have right underneath it, it'll say note, you know, the, the mold has to be caused by a covered peril, okay? <laughs> Most home insurance policies, or a, a significant number of home insurance policies in, this, in the state of Texas today do not cover repeated and or continuous water leaks from plumbing systems, heating or air conditioning systems, or domestic appliances. Since they don't cover that, even if the, that $5,000 for mold is in there, it doesn't trigger it because it's not covered under the basic policy. Okay, so, uh, you know, one of the things that we struggle with is, uh, you know, it, it just happened yesterday. One of our clients called, got a quote. We, we quoted her the, um, you know, we were too high. You know, I work for State Farm. We were too high. So uh, the, uh, some of her providers found her a lower cost policy that is, doesn't cover everything that our policy covers. Now, you know, that's, that's a big deal. It's not a big deal. She's going to be able to get the house because she supposedly couldn't get the house at our premium. But you know, the, the problem becomes, you know, are we, are we quoting coverage or, or are we getting coverage or mm -hmm. are, we, are we just quoting a premium? Right. And Francois will tell you that a lot of your reputable contractors will not do work for some you know, some name brand insurance companies because they don't get paid enough money to negotiate, you know, with the insurance adjusters for those companies to get the people even paid for what they owe. And so that's a huge problem, just like sitting still at a red light and having somebody from Fred Lawyer run into you, you know, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, if you're going to get, you know, they'll never pay you. So one of the questions that we um, kind of skipped over was insurance company issues a check, who gets the money? Um, that kind of falls right back into that. We're starting to, money's starting to go out. Who gets it and how is it dispersed? Okay, so after the mortgage, one of, one of the mortgage crises uh, or at the 86 tax law change and the oil bust and, and, and all of that, um, insurance companies and mortgage companies came to a very um, uneasy peace because the mortgage companies weren't telling us that the houses were vacant, the insurance companies weren't paying claims because you know the houses were vacant and there's vacancy clauses. And so there is a strong mortgage clause on the home insurance policy today that says that uh, if the damage, I believe with State Farm, it's, uh, it's either 15 or $1,700 to the dwelling and there is a lien or mortgage on there that we have to put the mortgage on the check. Bill? So this brings up kind of the catch-22 because Chapter 92 of the Texas Property Code says the period for repairs to be completed does not begin until the landlord has received the proceeds from the insurance company. <laughs> so how long does it take for a landlord to get the proceeds? And we're, we, we have a catch-22 there. Mm -hmm. yeah, you sure cannot is. repair this property if you don't have the insurance proceeds and probably the tenant can't live there and the tenant doesn't know that he's supposed to give notice that I'm vacating, he just left. And remember that the person that your clients, our clients are talking to at the mortgage company, they're reading that script, <laughs> okay? And if it doesn't say, do this, do this, do this, you know, you, what you're gonna you're gonna get somebody calling you in tears. I can't pay the contractor, you know, because they're using a contractor that doesn't use Xactimate and doesn't understand insurance and doesn't understand the the mortgage process, and uh, you know it can turn into a big old smelly mess in a hurry in an, an extremely emotional time. You know, I think that goes back to the the breathe and kind of step back and just, I mean, really try to talk to as many people as you can because that's where, when that stress level starts to go, people make decisions that they probably shouldn't make a lot of times. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned, go ahead, did you well, have something to add, Ron? say, just to kind of follow up on the lease issue because the con the real, the TREC contract is, treats that whole having to wait for insurance proceeds differently. So the, the lease, that's absolutely right. You don't yeah, have to make repairs. But under the contract, if it's a purchase and sale, the seller has got to complete those repairs before closing. 
<laughs> so, I mean, how's that going to happen? Especially like where we had Harvey, where it was building, building, building. We saw it come, and, and then it was there. Uh, so we ran into insurance problems. Where was the property occupied? So did you really have it insured? That kind of situation. But then, if it can't be repaired by closing, the buyer can extend that closing date up to 15 days. Well, that's not necessarily going to be very useful in a major catastrophe. They can terminate the contract, or they can accept the property, and they get an assignment of the insurance proceeds and um, a credit on the closing statement for the deductible. So those are three difficult choices, and so I kind of go back to your comment. You know, it's better to communicate and just work something out. And, re amendment. and remember that they th those people that didn't get the work done before closing still have to get the house insured for closing. Right. Okay, so, you know, you're, you, keep, you keep running into, you know, the different canyons, uh, and it's a mess. We thought well, we were fully prepared for Hurricane Harvey to land and the day of, we still had people wanting to close. And then we had some insurance companies that said, well, we're not going to insure. And we had some lenders that were saying, well, we're not going to loan. And so do you then have a duty as a title company to tell everybody that, hey, there are some insurance companies that say they're not going to insure. And, and some lenders will not process your loan without a reinspection or a reappraisal. So that was a dilemma for us because what are we allowed to say? in general to the people that are closing on and to be clear all insurance companies that that write insurance along coastal waters that may have hurricane exposure have limits that as the storm as the named hurricane storm comes closer you know they start cutting off writing new insurance policies you you can you can't even get insurance on a new car that you bought even if your policy's in effect you know, in some cases, depending on where the storm is until the storm passes. Well, then we ran into a lot of issues, you know, for weeks and weeks beyond the storm with uh, that having to reinspect, and there was no one to get out and reinspect the properties for the lenders to, to know that the property was in the condition it needed to be in to loan the money to close on the property. So a lot of delays and a lot of emotions, again, kind of start rising at that point. Uh, mentioned mold remediation and disclosure on mold. What else do we have to disclose? You've got to disclose everything. <laughs> and that's extremely important so it doesn't come back and bite you later. Because if you know that there is something wrong with the property mm -hmm. and you do not disclose, it can all get, it can all just totally come apart on you and on your, on your cellar. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that is going to be recommended here when everything starts getting put back together is wall cavity checks. <laughs> so sure, Joe's drywall put everything back together and it looks real pretty. <laughs> it looks great. But they didn't sand or put antimicrobial agent on, on the two befores or didn't wipe them down and didn't do the process properly. The mold is still going to be there, guys. So is the bacteria. So Somebody could go in and drill a small hole into a drywall. They can legally tap it three times to disturb it and suck air out of there. If that comes back hot for mold, now the whole house is going to be suspect. You know what's going to be great? You're not going to get mold. You're going to get radon. <laughs> yep. Any other comments on disclosure? So uh, from an insurance standpoint, um, if, if I do not disclose to a buyer that the house had mold, we did a mold test and we found mold, and then the, the buyer buys the house, and then six months later the buyer finds out that you didn't tell them it had mm -hmm. mold, that is not something that is covered under your personal liability insurance or your personal liability umbrella policy because intentional acts are not covered. For example, if you walk across the street and just beat the snot out of your neighbor, you know, that's good. But if you look at your, your other neighbor and say, I'm going to go across the street and beat the snot out of my neighbor across the street, then that's an intentional act and that is not covered. And 
thank goodness that we have we don't have a lot of those or we haven't had a lot of them but i've had clients and contractors and the the real real estate agents and the inspectors you know pay serious money to people out of their pocket because in a lot of cases that is not covered by insurance yeah we do um like i say a lot of the work that i do is litigation related and a lot of that involves or not a lot sometimes it involves uh, properties where there's no disclosure and all I could say to that would be disclose everything, <laughs> everything. Um, everything. and that um, that means not don't just say oh we had we had a flood I mean give over the documents because show the documents that show how much the work cost when it was done anything anything you've got related to that give it to them um, it's the kind of thing that you know I'm not an agent it's the kind of thing that might drive a few buyers away but the downside of that is if you don't disclose it and it comes back later and you're sued, that's the mm -hmm. kind of thing that can drag out for years. Yeah. And there's even if you win the case, you don't really win. I, th I think the disclosure question gets even more interesting for you as a realtor. If you know that this home or structure improvement was in an area that has been flooded, you may not have actual knowledge about that particular house. <laughs> But what if it was in an area that generally flooded? Is there a disclosure obligation in that context? And, you know, I think if you have, because here you get back to the lawsuit, first question is be, well, you knew that area generally flooded. Don't you think you had a reasonable basis to know that that was a house that might flood? Mm -hmm. So you're already two steps in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may want to, you know, use some discretion, but uh, always err on the side of disclosure without, you know, going overboard. So a couple of comments on that from, from Harvey in Houston. Um, Google went out and took new pictures during Harvey. Uh, we switched over from Tempo. We were the last one in Tempo <laughs> in, the, in the country, and we switched over to Matrix just a couple of weeks ago, and Google Maps and Matrix had all of our flooded areas on the maps when you clicked on. So, I mean, people were looking at that. I mean, and so it, it, was, it was really very interesting to see that. The, we jumped on adding something to our MLS, um, did, it, did the property flood in Harvey? Did the house flood in Harvey? And the reason we did that is because we were getting calls and calls and calls about people needing to find a home that wasn't flooded. So it wasn't necessarily to put it on MLS that, you know, that it didn't flood in Harvey, but to let people know what was still an available property you know, in the current market. The questions that then started to arise, which is very interesting, is, my home didn't flood in Harvey. Well, how come you have four feet of sheetrock pulled out? And, they, and it, well, it didn't flood until they released the reservoir. Well, that wasn't Harvey, so it didn't flood. It was water that came from the reservoir. So, I mean, you know, you, the consumer is going to put the spin on it that they want. Um, the questions that we um, heard from our friends in New Orleans who, you know, firsthand experience from their hurricane days said, you know, ask early and ask often the questions that you need to answer. It then got into people saying, you know, that you couldn't, I mean, this was kind of way off the charts, but, you know, it was like, if you really believe in the Bible, then all of these properties flooded at one time or another. And that is literally some of the conversations, that's where the conversations have gone in Houston. So it's, a, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you're struggling and everybody is emotional, but that, um, did it flood? And then the property, well, it just came up over the curb. That's not the property. So there's a lot of, um, Variations on that. I think a lot of us in Houston would just like the whole property thing to go away, as well as if it's an attached garage. Well, the water came in the garage, but it didn't come into the house. Well, <laughs> you know, so lots of lots of possible answers around that. Um, we talked about you know if we're under contract. Um, but is there anything else we should be aware of if we're under contract? Any comments or? I think the the financing addendum and. and could probably get a little more input there. You know, I've told, we talked a little bit about the contract itself, mm -hmm. but if there's a third party financing addendum, that's gonna create new issues because there may be a reinspection, there may be lender required repairs, and then so is it, does the seller wanna do it? You know, under the contract, the seller doesn't have to make those repairs. The buyer, I think, can um, terminate if it's more than 5% of the contract price. So there's a lot of things that can happen if we're in the middle of still getting uh, loan approved, uh, and you can address that a little more, I think, but there can be a lot of, you know, the fees, there's gonna be some reinspection fees, who's gonna pay for all that? Um, so it, it, the, just that third party financing can completely undo the deal, even though the contract may, may be fine. 
Uh, yeah. From a lender's uh, point of view, we have every time a disaster comes, we immediately have a bulletin come out that says every property has to have a reinspection on it. And if and if we're close to closing and the insurance hasn't backed out, everything is okay. We send the inspector out there and we get a clean bill of health. We'll go ahead and close and fund on that transaction. If there has if there has been uh, damage to the property. Uh, a lot of a lot of the serv um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will actually pay for some of these inspections, and if they go out and they detail the repairs that need to be done to that property, and they're completed, and we have a uh, an engineer certificate, uh, uh, a disaster inspection is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Then those, and, and it comes back clean. Then we'll go ahead and close on it. When you say inspection, are you referring to? I was first thinking a home inspection, but you're referring to an appraisal inspection. Is that correct? Appraisal or disaster uh, inspection. A disaster inspection would be if there's actual damage to the house and it has been listed and it's been repaired, then we have to have a certified engineer uh, send us a, uh, an all clear on the inspection. I have a question. <laughs> if there was an approved loan and it didn't close because of the disaster, does the in the interest rate lock is lost? Does it start the process all over again, or is that an issue? It means as far as the interest rate. Yes, sir. Um, I think it's been my experience that we have extended locks, um, and I've I've actually had to pay for some of them myself to keep the deal together, which is which is okay as part of business, but. Yeah, we, we need to watch all that stuff because that is, interest rate locks are secured with a, uh, are locked on the market and they're hedged out. So we have, we do have to watch that. And those people don't care that it has a, that has a flood. So we'd have to extend that lock. So that's something, if you have a good loan officer, they'll know that. But it's something realtors should also know, say, well, what about your lock? I mean, just general knowledge that you guys should have. You know, one other interesting piece that came around closings is we had areas that you couldn't get back into unless you were a homeowner. And we had properties under contract that didn't flood. And we had sellers saying that were under contract saying, you have to close. You were supposed to close on or before this date or you're in default. Um, so, again, the more we can do to counsel people to help them stay calm and be realistic, I mean, they, they couldn't even move in. And water was still at points rising and you weren't sure if it was going to, to flood or not. But, um, you know, most of those we were able to, to keep at bay just, you know, by having conversations and, and holding off. But, I mean, just it's interesting what people just start to, to try to demand when, when they're in that emotional, emotional state. Uh, Scott, one of the comments that you had made in, in a conversation was, how do you go about estimating the value of a property affected by a disaster? Well, yeah, when we get, we're, we're usually hired late in the process. Um, for example, we haven't done anything Harvey related right now. Um, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll, it'll depend on whether, uh, you know, when we, when we work on, we did a lot of work on the Bastrop and Spicewood fires, uh, and we've done some flood work around here. And in those cases, there are cases where it's a natural, the fire was a natural disaster, but there were allegations that it was, um, <laughs> It was caused by negligence, um, either not clearing power lines properly or having power lines that were so old and badly maintained that it was just a matter of time that they were going to fall over. Um, so in this case, uh, there's basically a, a third party to go after um, in terms of, of trying to recoup your loss of value. Um, what we do is we're just trying to value a property as of a particular point in time. It could be immediately after the disaster happens. It could be down the road after the property's already been reconstructed. Um, in the case of the stuff that's uh, immediately after, like we did a lot of lot valuations in Bastrop, um, basically what we're looking for is sales of properties uh, that occurred under similar circumstances, properties that had just burned. Um, in the case of Bastrop, there was actually a fairly robust market for <laughs> Uh, lot sales right in the, in the months after the fire, and most of them sold at a pretty severe discount because instead of lots, this wasn't exceptionally valuable land anyway, but people liked them because of the old growth pine trees on mm -hmm. them. Well, after the fire, you had no pine trees. 
you know, your, your property looked like a moonscape and yeah. where it had a bunch of dead trees on it. Um, and there were a lot of people, and I think we're going to see this in Harvey too, uh, people who are just emotionally devastated mm -hmm. and they don't even care what they get for it. They just mm -hmm. want out. Mm -hmm. um, so in my experience, you find the largest discounts in those cases. Mm -hmm. But if it's a situation where in that immediate area you can't find sales, what we try to do is go outside that particular market and look for properties in similar situations that have sold. So it might be a case where I'm doing a property in Austin, but I find a property in Houston that sold under similar circumstances. And then to that property that sold in Houston, I find competing properties with it that weren't affected by that condition and try to determine a discount from that. So in one of our reports, effectively, we have appraisals within appraisals. Um, every case study that we do, if I, have a, if I have a report with, say, seven or eight case studies, in effect, I've got a report with eight different appraisals in it. Wow. And it's, it's a process that is, uh, can take a long time. But um, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, they will find a value. You know, these guys are good, and, you know, there, there is a place where they will find that value. Yeah, and you know, sometimes it's an exact percentage point. Sometimes it's a range. Um, a lot of times you can't find, you know, we're looking for needles and haystacks. And sometimes you find properties that were damaged a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, and you just have to use your experience and interpolate between them. But to give you, when, when I'm involved, to give you an idea of how long this process is and why being in a lawsuit can be uh, a tricky situation if you're an agent, um, the Bastrop fires occurred September 4, 2011. Spicewood fires were the same day. Um, the insurance people send out, they have their investigators. Actually, the law firm I work for has their own forensic team to try to determine whether there was any human error involved. Uh, our firm got contacted towards the end of 2014 on a particular property in Spicewood. And I first looked at the property in February of 2015, and I did an appraisal on it. My deposition in that, ca in that case took place uh, six months ago, <laughs> and the case settled in July. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we're talking about almost six years between the date of the fire and the date my case settled. Um, and that was an insurance subrogation case. Um, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's a lengthy and, and ugly process, um, even if you win. Um, it can be questionable, questionable how much you actually really win. Must have been a good deposition. <laughs> uh, one of them was really short. Um, the other deposition I did lasted about, uh, involved 20 properties and lasted about eight hours. Wow. It, was, uh, wow. it was a long day. So we've talked a lot about Harvey. We've talked about the, uh, the fires in Bastrop. What other disasters, I mean, you've, You've had experience on other types of disasters too, haven't you? Or do you all? Me. Well, either, sure, both of ahead. you? Or? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Bastard one was the main one. We've mm -hmm. appraised uh, somewhere in the range of 30 to 40 properties on that. Sometimes it was lot damage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was insurance subrogation where mm -hmm. the insurance company has paid off the uh, property owner. But because there is a third party allegedly at fault, they go after that party and try to claw some of that money back. And in those cases, we were going in. We weren't appraising the land, but we were trying to, you know, the insurance company has their methodology in terms of what they feel that the house is worth. But for legal purposes, they also needed an opinion on um, just what the market value of the improvements were, which is where we basically appraised the property, appraising as, as of the day before the fire, and figure out what the whole property is worth, and then figure out what the lot is worth, and then... A minus B equals what the improvements are worth. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, we haven't done anything on Harvey. Um, we may down the road. But we've done some other flooding cases in Houston where properties were allegedly uh, detention systems weren't properly built, and it made it created situations where bad rainfall created a uh, flooding situation on the property. Um, we worked on a subdivision once where they were building another subdivision next door, and they had the uh, filters set up on the uh, storm sewers to keep you know, dirt runoff and mm -hmm. everything from going into it. 
And the filters were a little bit too tight. And mm -hmm. so what happened is they got built up with silt and they wouldn't drain anymore. And then there was a heavy rainfall and it flooded the neighboring subdivision. Um, it, like I say, in the case of Bastrop, we, uh, that, those were allegations of power lines not being handled properly. Um, we worked on Tropical Storm Hermine, which I was looking back at the files on that, and the case on that was eight to 10 inches of rain in a 36 hour period, which almost sounds quaint compared to, <laughs> to what Harvey, I looked at that and I was like, oh yeah, that doesn't really sound too bad, uh, which gives you an idea of how, really how bad Harvey was. That was a case where it wasn't a residential property. We were working on a hospital where they had built a new um, exterior envelope that was designed to keep water from coming into the hospital, except the builder allegedly cut corners and was putting uh, heavy gauge staples from the outside of the envelope to the inside. And so basically, it yeah. created a conduit to bring water mm -hmm. into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And we had cases where ICU, uh, intensive care units had water intrusion and mold intrusion. And I'm not a doctor, but I would think that's not a desirable condition. Um, they had ICU units that were unusable for about six months. Um, so those are, the, those are the kind of cases we work in where it is a natural disaster, but there's some sort of, unfortunately, there's some sort of human element that either caused the disaster or made a bad condition worse. You mean it's not hail damage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, fortunately, in Houston, we're starting to reach the point that um, we're, we're getting some of those comps that are after Harvey. Because, I mean, you know, for several mm -hmm. months, there were, I mean, you had pre Harvey mm -hmm. comps and you had no post Harvey comps and you, know, you couldn't appraise it. So it's, I mean, it's, you know, they did say, most of our appraisers say it'll take about a year to, to really adjust out, even on the normal, um, yeah. you I know, mean, buys and sells. But, you know, there's, I, I, it's not, I haven't been able to study it too closely yet, but I've heard anecdotal evidence of, uh, some early sales right after the disaster. Of course, they sold at huge discounts. Mm -hmm. It was just people yeah. who wanted mm -hmm. to get out. Um, you know, it's 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 a situation where I think it's going to be difficult to compare. I don't think it's a situation where you want to just compare it to Katrina mm -hmm. because New Orleans lost about 50% of their housing stock. Um, and uh, in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, there was actually a spike in housing pro mm -hmm. uh, prices. It didn't last very long, mm -hmm. and then we had the recession, and then hundreds of thousands of people moved out. And in some areas in New Orleans, they're barely getting back to what values were in 2005. <clears throat> My feeling is in Houston, it's gonna be more localized, mm -hmm. depending on where you flooded or not. Mm -hmm. And quality areas are going to maintain their values better. And areas that were maybe a little bit on the sketchier side, they're probably gonna turn into more investor-owned communities. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's gonna be, we're, we're gonna find out as time goes by. Yeah. I participated in over 200 of the Bastrop fire cases, uh, giving an opinion and an estimate on the actual home and the personal belongings. The <coughs> folks that broke out a lot better had taken pictures and had pictures mm -hmm. stored, mm -hmm. maybe in a mm -hmm. bank safety box. Wow. And they were able to show me pictures of all the personal belongings, whether it's a lamp or a pair of shoes or whatever it was, all of it has a value. And the more documentation that you can have, the better. Some of my clients even had videos walking through the house. And then you store that somewhere different so that when you do have something like that, you're able to show the adjuster, here's what I had. You've already got it documented. That's gonna help your claim go so much faster. So what we tell people to do is when they're watching Real Housewives, <laughs> you know, at night, <laughs> is during a commercial, go into one room and just stand there and, and take a picture, you know, from every corner, open all the drawers, open all the closets, take, take a picture, next commercial go into the next room, next commercial go into the next room, and that way in one hour, uh, in between the women fighting, uh, you can document your house and get it at, get the stuff out of the house. The other thing we tell people is after after you 
experience a major loss or a loss, go, go buy a notebook or get a notebook. You, you, you write down everything you do. You write everything you, everybody you talk to. You write phone numbers. You get as much information as you can, you know, without being too melodramatic, and just keep a list of that. Uh, and that way, when the adjuster comes out and says, well, who told you that? You go, mm-hmm. oh, well, Let's... that was Sally on day number two. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, folks, the insurance people are, are people too. And some of them are really, really good in quality. And some of them just suck. <laughs> okay? And so uh, if you happen to get that independent FEMA adjuster you know, whose wife just left him and his dog mm-hmm. just died and he's an independent contractor and you can't get to him through Donald Trump's tweets, okay, you know, it's just going to suck. And so, you know, the more document, the more valid documentation you have, the easier it will be to get help at some point, you know, if you're dealing with the right providers. Kind of switching back to um, contracts and closings and things like that, um, from the standpoint of a builder contract versus a TAR contract, have you all seen any differences out there with those types of? Well, the builder contract's usually drafted by the builder, Mm -hmm. surprise. Uh, So it's going to be favorable to the builder. It has a (laughs) uh, casualty clause that's not quite as even-handed as the Mm -hmm. track form would be, but in general, it's going to follow the Texas common law, which is it's risk of loss is mine until we transfer title, and then the risk of loss is yours once you have title. And that's where all of the uh, provisions about ins- you know, having insurance mm-hmm. and all that kicks in. Of course, the, the difficult situation is when we're in mid-contract, and then and we talked about all these natural disasters, some of which we can prepare for, we see them coming. But we also have like tornadoes, and nobody mm-hmm. knows when that's coming. Now, immediately you're dealing with that risk of loss. The builder will, um, what we saw after Harvey is that the builder still wanted to sell the units, and they did an emergency uh, walkthrough, and they still closed those units. And if there was anything that needed to be repaired, those became part of an agreed punch list or repair list. Mm-hmm. Uh, the houses are also now typically, with a large builder, covered by a warranty of a year or so. And so that sort of really made the issue less of one than you might expect. Because you've got a, a, a builder with a reputation that they want to maintain, <laughs> and they want to make sure they deliver a quality product. Uh, so it really turned out to be less of an issue. Mm-hmm. And they were in newer neighborhoods, which seemed to have a little more... Um, development, flood control. We saw less damage in new neighborhoods than we did in older neighborhoods. Unless they were built right near our reservoirs. There you go. (laughs) As I understood it, the area that flooded was actually a dry reservoir. Yeah, yeah. So So, uh, with, with insurance, if I have private insurance, does FEMA still get involved from that aspect or? Well, FEMA is insurance. Mm hmm Okay, the National Flood Insurance Program sells flood insurance, and as I understand it, uh, so um, you can buy up to $250,000 coverage on the house and $100,000 coverage on the personal property through NFIP. Mm -hmm. Um, Many of y'all know my wife is an independent insurance agent, and she's got a company that will sell flood insurance on top of that, but most uh, carriers... um, uh, most direct riders, farmers, State Farm, Liberty Mutual, you know, will will not have access to that. Uh, but then beyond that, um, you know, I think it's thirty five or thirty thousand or thirty five thousand dollars that they can apply for or get an SBA loan. Um, you know, but that's pretty much it. There's a couple of requirements. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's correct. It, there's a sixty day period to apply. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people think FEMA is just flooding, which they do manage the insurance program, but they're also emergency aid. And as, as Ted said, there's a $33,000, $34,000 cap on how much you can get. But in that application, they're going to respond to you, and they're going to want to know, one, have you made an application with your homeowner's insurance? So they want to see that application. They're going to want you to be able to prove title. Finally, were you, were you were useful for something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they're going to want to know, have you 
apply for an SBA loan if you're in a certain income level, and then they'll reply to you. They did extend it this time, um, but I think that ended November 24th. So if you haven't applied for your FEMA aid, you're probably too late. So if I'm a new homeowner, what should I be asking my insurance company when purchasing a new home? Well, What's important in these question. days? Uh, I, have, I, I have a uh, sheet out there about what to do during the option period, but get the stuff done during the option period, folks. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, you, need to be, uh, you need to be asking for a uh, disclosure statement that lists all, you know, all events. You need to probably run a flood zone check. And just to be clear... <laughs> And, you know, a lot of people in this room have heard me say this ad nauseum, but every property in the United States of America is in a floodplain, <laughs> is in a flood zone, okay? It, the question is what the relativity of the house being flooded in the next 25, 50, 100, 250, 500 years, okay? And that's what the flood rates are based on. So if you're over at Walnut Creek, over off Loyola, you know, your house is 15 feet underwater, okay? In the new subdivisions, the reason they didn't flood so much is because the flood control, you know, is better until a couple years down the road when all the dead trees die and jam up the bridges and the water can't go underneath the bridges, so it goes out into the subdivisions. Okay, so uh, you, need to, you need to get a loss history on the, the house. You need to get a flood zone check. And, uh, and most insurance companies will not insure a house that does not have a five-year useful life left in their roof, okay? Most insurance companies will not insure, most quality insurance companies will have a problem insuring houses with multiple water claims on it, okay? People, pe uh, if the house hadn't had water claims but the buyers had water claims, or other claims, that can be a problem. And, and so, you know, getting, getting all that stuff done in the option period, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a big deal. If you're, as a seller, you know, as a listing agent, asking the, the seller to call their insurance carrier and get a list of the claims that they've had, uh, asking the insurance agent to run a flood zone check. I mean, wouldn't you rather know before you know, right. the, you know, before, you know, you list the property that a house is in a 100-year floodplain in zone AE because you're going to call me and say, hey, I got a house that's in flood zone AE. Can you give me a flood rate? And I'm going to say, do you have an elevation certificate? And you're going to say, what's that? And I'm going to explain it to you. And you're going to say, well, why do I need that to just get a quote? And that's the rules. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, so wouldn't you rather know that up front rather than find that out three days before closing when all these people are on the hook and waiting for you and, and now you got to negotiate a deal that's going to have a $4,000 flood insurance premium? So, um, uh, so uh, and, you know, being honest with the sellers, you know, if they got a tree laying on their roof, get the tree off the roof. You know, if you can't see the front of the house because the bushes are growing up underneath the eaves, you know, get the, get the bushes off the eaves of the house. Insurance companies have 60 days from the date of the application or from the effective date of the application to terminate a, a home insurance policy. So insurance companies hire independent inspectors to go out and, and, and check to make sure that I'm not a piece of crap agent sending in piece of crap business. Mm -hmm. And so as long as it's within that 60 days, they can do anything they want. Okay? So, you know, uh, stuff like that. And the other thing is if a house is flooded before and a flood claim has been paid, y'all need to know that in some cases, like on County Road 123 out in Williamson County, you know, you go out there and you see houses that are being raised because, you know, they have to raise them to get a permit from the city or the county to rebuild the house because those houses have flooded before. Okay, so, you know, you need to be careful about that. If you're working with somebody that's going to remodel a house that has had been flooded before, they may not be able to get a permit to remodel it. So you need to know that, you know, during the option period. Can you get a permit to, to do a remodel on houses that have flooded before? 
So we've uh, we've answered a lot of questions. Uh, if, if there's anything I've missed with any of you all that you want to add to um, to the comments or questions that I mean, I think a lot of our questions were covered in some of our other questions. But if there's anything you want to add, or if you had one takeaway for the group, what would it be today? Well, Proper disclosures, I think, is is very very important. And let's just err on the side of caution, and just use a little common sense. One good thing is go open every single cabinet that has any, any water around it, your sinks, your bathrooms. Look behind the toilets. Do you see any discoloration there? Stuff like that is very important. So not just big, huge, catastrophic stuff, but anything small. Hey, my toilet overflowed in this particular bathroom. Let them know. And that's going to keep you clean. Go ahead, uh -huh. Bill. I think my, right. mine would, I mean, we've kind of touched on it, would be to, com as we said, to communicate immediately. Mm -hmm. It's just like your plane's delayed and nobody's telling you why. You know, it's so much better <laughs> yeah. than you know. Uh, so just tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. it's, the first yes. question is, how are you? I think that's mm -hmm. exactly right. Yep. Uh, and then come up with a plan, you know, mm -hmm. empathize and come up with a plan. And so insurance claims need to be made. You need to document what you're doing. You need to take pictures. Um, all of that kind of falls in that communication bucket, but I think that's key to dealing with a disaster. I think one of the very first statements that was made today was that people in times of stress are going to go, oh, 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 I know this relator. <laughs> <laughs> I know this guy. I'm going to call this guy and ask him what am I supposed to do. Yeah. Or as and your name and the members of the public have a reasonable expectation that we are smarter than they are about all things real estate. But you have to be very careful that you don't cross a line. You know, I think always share your empathy with these people. Ask them to call a real estate attorney if they have something that's outside your scope because we are not attorneys. Some of you guys may be, but we need to remember what our scopes of knowledge are, and if it's outside that scope, empathize with them, make sure they're okay. Is there anything I can possibly help you with? I don't know the answer to that question. You need to contact a real estate attorney. Uh, for my part, I would agree with what Francois said about disclosure, but also in, in my appraising these kind of properties, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do is put a value, put a number on uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And in a disaster, it's, it's a, a condition of extreme uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you ever have a listing on a property like this, anything you can do to reduce that uncertainty, get the ball rolling on anything that needs to be taken care of, um, disclosing disclosing some of these things isn't fun, but uh, I think it protects you, and it's the kind of thing that will make a potential buyer possibly more comfortable, knowing mm -hmm. knowing everything that's going on with the house instead of discovering new and uncomfortable things after the closing has already occurred. Anything to reduce uncertainty and risk will will help you and potentially you know get you closer to the kind of uh, price you're looking for. Ted or Tom? Um, Y'all got one of these uh, printouts right here, right, for homeowners affected by natural disaster. This is this is really good. Uh, this would be there are set there. We want to help people get their lives back together. And if you have a general knowledge of where to go, where you can assist, just, you know, you could assist clients by saying, well, if you're not going to stay in that house. You know, there's there's certain places that you can there's things that we can do. Now, uh, for example, if we stop the payments for a while, if because their income is affected, uh, you they won't have late fees, they won't have late fees, they won't have delinquencies reported on their credit report. Uh, you won't have to catch up on all the payments at once, but they will have to catch up if they go into a deferment type of situation. Um, always work with your servicer. Now, the, if you have a homeowner that's going to stay in that house, like documentation is the key. But we have, two pro, we have three programs, actually, that can help those, uh, those homeowners. 
Now, if they want to re rebuild, there's a 203K streamline that FHA just came out with that is $35,000. And that is fairly new. And then if they still want to rebuild, then we have a little bit, uh, we can use the regular 203K. And that's an FHA program. That is for uh, a remodel. Uh, we can do that in conjunction with this disaster that has happened to them. And then we have the 203H program, which has been, became very popular recently. It's been around, but it's become very popular. The 203H will disregard their, their late payments if they had to miss payments on other credit obligations because they were in this disaster. And we, we do have to prove that they lived in the area and this helped, and this disaster caused them to be late on their payments. FHA will allow down to a 500 credit score and zero down in order to buy a new house for those folks. This would apply also to renters can do this. And we've had some renters that, uh, and you, you may have seen some of this over there, but the, the, the 203H program is a, you know, it's a, it's a rebuilding program. It's the only mm -hmm. FHA program that has zero down. Um, also, one interesting fact that you m probably don't know is that if you've had a di uh, disaster declaration, and I do have some maps I put on, on uh, I made a couple of the maps, and then if you go onto FEMA's website under disasters, it'll show you all the disasters in Texas. And if there's been a disaster declared, you could still use a 203H program in any disaster declared county. A lot of people don't know that. But Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they have, um, you know, that we had a, a, a seminar on that recently. So that's really important stuff. So you just have, just have a little bit of knowledge about that so you can go, yeah, there is something out there that will help you rebuild. And somebody mentioned SBA loans earlier, and that, that is actually uh, uh, a source for people to, to help them rebuild their situation. I'd say two things. First of all, um, for all the real estate agents in the room, there's, there's thousands and thousands of choices of home insurance policy coverages in the state of Texas right now as a result of the mold mess. It can go all the way from burn down, blow down only, you know, to some fairly serious coverage. Y'all need to know what kind of policy the person that you're, the insurance agent you're referring business to is offering your clients. Because um, I'm going to tell you, there's some name brand companies that don't sell the <laughs> water leakage and seepage coverage at all. Okay, that's, that can be a big deal. They may, people may save money on the premium, but they may not mm -hmm. save money, you know, when it comes to a claim, right, Francois? Absolutely. And so, so that's number one. You need to, you know, and, you know, start with your own insurance coverage. Does anybody here know how to read an insurance policy? <laughs> and, I, and I'm, I'm being facetious, but I mean, I know you know how to read, but, you know, you pick up the policy, you pick out, take out the jacket, and you start reading the exclusions first. Because once you know what's not covered, it's easier to understand what is covered, number one. Number two... You, you need to be dealing with somebody that has a flood insurance expert in their office. There are some ways that in some cases you can save people literally thousands of dollars on flood insurance premiums if you have someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and I happen to be one of those people, but I'm not going to tell you why I know that because then that would not differentiate me, right? But, you know, there are ways that you can do that. So, you know, uh, uh, and we know the flood claim process is as onerous as that is. So we can help you and your clients with that. Roland, did you have another I, comment? I just was going to maybe by a point of clarification. Um, obviously, I do need the title company can help you walk through whatever the rights are in a pending transaction. But we keep hearing in Washington all of this debate about how much aid we're going to get. And so we need to remember that FEMA is just a temporary um, mm -hmm. assistance. And now we're dealing with the larger funding that will be HUD will come in and assess what needs to be done, and then actually the general land office of all things administers whatever HUD decides needs to be done. And so there'll, there'll be a posting period where people can comment and make suggestions about what should be done, but it's going to be very brief. And then that's where the John Sharp appointment comes in. He'll be kind of directing what the general land office is doing. So we still have a long ways 
to go for recovery on a natural disaster of this scale, and there will be more um, aid applications, more administration yet to come. It will take years before something like Harvey is back to full recovery, although we do predict that in about six, seven months, there will be sort of a mini housing boom in the, in the Harris County area. We think there will be sort of a resurgence once people figure out what their insurance proceeds are, what their damages are, uh, be, I think the market will rebound. Yeah, kind of a tie-in on that. When we had our um, network broker from New Orleans that came over and talked to several of us, they said that after the hurricane in New Orleans, that I mean, it was a 90-year-old company, and they actually saw the 12 months after the hurricane, they saw the, the best year that they've ever had in the 90 years of the history of their company for their real estate firm. So, um, I mean, in some ways they said it is kind of like a forest fire. It kind of takes down some of the things that needed to be taken down and allows you to rebuild and, and regrow. Um, but they had the one area, I think it's Lakeview in New Orleans, that was just devastated by the break. And um, it came back stronger. They thought it would never be rebuilt because of the levy. And they said it came back and rebuilt and it was stronger and ever and their prices have just continued to maintain and grow in that area. So um, it is, I mean, we are a resource for all of these people in, in a disaster and, and they, everybody needs a place to live. So I think the more we can be a resource and the more we can help them, the better off we'll all be. Do we have any questions from the audience? Do you all ever work with public adjusters? All the time. <laughs> well, he'll, work, he'll say yes, and I'll say no. <laughs> Why do you say no? Well, um, I'm willing to work with anybody, but uh, mo public adjusters tend to take their role with me as an adversarial role. And, you know, my, my interest is making my client, putting my client in the best position I can, and for the most part, I have an issue with the way a lot of public adjusters go, go about that job. And, let, and I let them know that, so. They have very little authority, just so you know. Very, very yeah, little and, and the client pays them. And, you know, so, I mean, I've climbed two roofs in the last two weeks, you know, to look for hail damage, you know, because, <laughs> you know, the adjuster says no, the roofer uh -huh. says yes. You know, so I'm, I'm very actively involved. So I, I have an idea of what goes on. Uh, the last public adjuster I dealt with was emailing me and uh, uh, KVU, uh, the, uh, the gal on KVU, to tell me that State Farm should have paid a claim in Elgin three years ago, you know, and couldn't prove that there was hail damage on the roof that he was, you know, hired to do. I have a question from every one of us is going to be dealing with people who are going through um, somewhat equally personal devastations. So how can we apply this on a personal level if you've got a client that has it? Can we take most of this and maybe, you know, if somebody's, you know, they find that their house is, is a, the nightmare that they never knew about um, so that they can get an SBA loans or, you know, even these 203H or 203Ks for them rebuilding their lives. So is, is there much that they can apply to that? Because certainly we've dealt with all of those, but even just on the minute level, this seems like really good information for that. Well, my thoughts on it, um, the FEMA would not be available to you oh. unless there's been a declared disaster. But the SBA loans and the FHA programs are there they're not dependent upon there being a declared disaster. So those are still options. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the insurance, the, the private insurance carrier, your agent, I mean, that's, that's a place to start immediately. The you two, know, and uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. The 203H is dependent uh, on, on disaster. But the other FHA programs, of course, you can use the 203K streamline or 203K anytime. And you know, I, I would offer two things. First of all, you need to be a little bit cautious because the deeper you go into it with them, the deeper you, you get. And uh, I would just tell you, just like I've got on my documents out there, I've got some contractors' you know, names. I, I have those contractors' names there because they're my professionals. They're my eyes and ears. You know, I, I trust them explicitly. And 
And so I would sit down with your providers and say, this is what my expectation is of you. If this happens, can you do that? And if, you know, there's going to be some things that may not be able, you know, uh, to get done. Uh, but the other thing is um, uh, sometimes you cannot help people help themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is a struggle. Hi, Jim Smith. I'm president and broker of the property management company. You've done a great job of talking about our customers and our clients. <clears throat> Excuse me. Would you mind speaking briefly to the importance of why I, as a broker, should have a disaster plan to be able to not only handle our customers and clients, but our own offices? I know many, many brokers around in the areas, you know, New Orleans, that I've gone down to assist them rebuilding their companies. It's amazing how we, as brokers, lack a disaster plan. So would you all mind speak briefly to that? I'll speak to it just a little bit, and then I'll let them add on to it, because we, we've put some things in place <coughs> since Harvey hit. Um, obviously, um, you know, we had a central point of communication. I, my owner broker was actually devastated and lost their home. So they were very happy to have me in place and have not lost anything at, at the time. So um, we put into place a, a system for communication and what to expect. Um, we actually sent out a daily communication to everybody with, I mean, anybody that got information, they sent it to me. I checked it out uh, before I sent it out to, because they were sending it to their clients and their customers and things like that. So, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I think having a, a way to communicate a valid, what we found is we had agents that showed up at our offices that said, why is nobody here? Because they're 80 years old and they weren't checking email because they don't know how to check their email from home. I mean, yeah, seriously. I mean, I'm like, the building's closed. And our building, my building that I office out of was closed for three weeks. We could not access it without a policeman walking us up the building. So um, just from, from the communication standpoint, I mean, we've put some, some barriers in place and some, you know, who to go to and who to look for. Uh, and we also put some systems in place for how we communicate with our our clients and, and, and the community. So we put several, lots of different um, protocols in place where we could provide assistance uh, to the community. You know, at, um, at North American Title, we also set up a um, aid program for employees and then um, also contributed to the United Way. And we let them, they could contribute generally for the Houston community or for specifically folks that were employees of North American Tile. So that was useful. I know TAR had a program. Mm -hmm. But we also, your data, you need to already have a, pro, a, a plan where you have data storage off-site or in a second mm -hmm. location uh, because if you have it in that one location and it's flooded, well, you're, you're in or a heap burnt. of trouble. Um, one of the uh, other things, we business interruption insurance, it's feasible, but I'll, t I'll give you a little quick story. Uh, before I did this, I took this position with North American Tile, I was with Winstead, which is a law firm around the state, and we had offices in Houston. And when uh, the earlier, um, I've forgotten the name of the hurricane that came through that was so windy, it took all the windows Freedom. out. Our lawyers all were able to go home and work remotely, and the business interruption didn't do us any good. So you need to really think about what you really need covered in the event of a catastrophe. More and more as we're able to re work remotely, business interruption may not help you in that scenario. And that may help you if the power cable gets cut off and you're out for three days. Or That's kind of what we saw in Irma. We have offices in Florida, and it wasn't water damage. It was the wind knocking down trees, and we couldn't get down the roads to get to the offices, and the power was out. And so it was a different kind of business interruption helped us a lot there, whereas it didn't help us so much uh, with Harvey. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick, if I can, <laughs> one of my partners at Winstead was a guy, uh, Ross, uh, and he was, a, he was with the A&M Corps, he was a rabbit Aggie, and he went every season to the, all the A&M games, even under today's circumstances. Um, <laughs> And so he had his season tickets on the edge of his desk there in the office tower, the chase tower. And that tornado, the tornadic winds off to the hurricane hit and took all the glass off the side of the building. And they couldn't get back in there for about 10 days. And so he was anxious because he didn't have his tickets. Finally, they opened it up and let everybody back in. And the tickets, every, everything's all blown around, desks removed, and the tickets were still sitting on the corner of his desk. 
And uh, one of the other guys, the managing partner, said, see, Ross, even God doesn't want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was a good story. <laughs> Just talk to your talk to your insurance agent. Sit down with your insurance agent and see what he can offer you. You know the business interruption um, insurance is hard to to prove in a lot of cases because we've we've had we did it with you know her other hurricanes in Houston. Um, but interestingly enough, we were able to go back um, and get some rent reductions. Men, our landlords were able to get rent reduction or from our turn that in for their business interruption because we couldn't access buildings and things like that. So we did get a break on rent in several of our buildings that we couldn't access. One, uh, just, I'm sorry, to, uh, to your question, perhaps having a written document in electronic form that have the hyperlinks and have all these resources, you know, Fannie Mae, inspections required, FHA, SBA, having all that in, in a, uh, a written document, electronic form, uh, would, would be helpful also in your plan. Thank you all so very much for being here in your professionalism and wonderful wealth of knowledge. Mr. Heaton, question. Uh, about 10 days ago, I closed a transaction and my buyer was offered through the insurance company uh, on a home that had been recently remodeled, but it was an older home. And they had a choice of replacement and I need explanation, and these folks need to know about it. So it's builder cost replacement and or, and I don't remember what they call the other, but do Common you? Common construction? I'm not sure, but it would okay. cover, it would cover the higher value for the, for the remodeling that they okay. had done. So can you explain or elaborate on that and what we should ask for, for our clients? Well, so just, I'll make this as brief as I can. Uh, after the mold mess, um, insurance carriers in the state of Texas changed a bunch of, uh, changed the majority of their insurance contracts, and some of, some of it has to do with water leakage, some of it has to do with foundation, some of it has to do with d different deductibles, and as that has continued to evolve, there are major insurance companies today that sell actual cash value policies for roof damage. So what that means is if you, you buy a house and you get that coverage and you have a 30-year shingle on your roof that's 15 years old and it gets hailed on, you're effectively putting the roof on yourself because you're not going to get paid. The actual value of that roof isn't going to meet your deductible probably. Another way that insurance companies are limiting you know, uh, you know, what they pay is there's full replacement costs with like kind and quality. There's common area construction. So if you live in an area where sheet vinyl is common, you know, then your insurance company can put sheet vinyl back in your house instead of the hardwood floors that you had in there. Um, and you know, I, I, I never, we, I don't ever sell that. I see it. We have a policy that offers that option. But like Francois will tell you, you know, the, the last thing people need to hear, you know, um, it, you know, when, uh, you know, when I show up or Francois shows up is, oh crap, you know, I mean, that's what my coverage is and does. And, and that's the point that I'm, I'm trying to make with you. And thank you for bringing that up because it, it is a real, um, you know, it's not just upfront premium anymore with insurance companies and home or rental properties either. Uh, there are, uh, my wife sells a lot of uh, rental dwelling policies that covers foundation, you know, water leaks and foundation. Our policy doesn't really cover that anymore. Okay, and so, but you know what? I tell people that because I don't need them crawling up my rear end and I don't need Francois telling them that I'm a piece of crap insurance agent. And so, you know, it's critical you know, that, that, that you just know what your insurance agent is offering people. Uh, it's huge down in Houston. You know, there's, there's insurance coverages all over the place in Houston. Um, you know, but they'll close deals and mortgage companies will accept the policy. Uh, I will try to get, you know, Susan, what I'll do, I'll, when I send uh, Diane the links, I'll try to get some definitions and put that in there for y'all. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Mr. Horn, you'd mentioned earlier about the um, the forbearance, and then you also mentioned about um, the the uh, landlord's forbearance. 
in your experience, has it been easier for the uh, homeowner or the landlord to uh, get some sort of a forbearance? And if, if that's the case, um, are they, are they, as far as time-wise, are they, do they each get a year? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll just tell you up front, I know for a fact if you're a homeowner, you can get forbearance. As far as an, uh, as an investor goes, I don't know if you can get forbearance. I think you're stuck. You have to pay that payment. That's what I think, but I don't know. The, would you agree with that? I, I would agree that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, because I, I, I haven't encountered I haven't encountered that where I mean I think you'd have to be in a uh, the investor would have to be in a position that all of all of his property including his maybe he lived next door or something like that maybe that, that maybe that would fall into that but that would be a, a servicing question. I'll send some information too, just from the standpoint of, I mean, I started keeping a folder on my Outlook with everything that we gathered from Harvey, and I'll try to put something together that I can send to Valerie and she can send out to you all. But um, the other th one thing from a real estate standpoint that we started doing, and fortunately, the night that Harvey hit, I pulled a printout of everything that was going on in MLS. I pulled all of our MLS, all of our my office. And then we were, I ran it every week, so like every Friday, and then I sent it out to my agents, which gave them a wealth of knowledge because everybody was calling them going, what's happening? You know, is the market falling out? Are things terminating? And they had that information easily accessible to them. And the last people to not forget about is the survivors because there is a huge level of survival guilt that happens for those that didn't get affected by it. They're just going, what can I do? And they feel guilty even showing up to, to help somebody sometimes. So um, figure out a way to put people to work to make them feel like they can give back. All right, well, thank you, Shelley. Thank you, the whole entire panel. I think we can all agree that this has really been informative. We covered just a whole wide range of, of topics that we can take back to our client. Yes, Bill, one more. So I wanna, I wanna finish my information to you guys out in this room who are my colleagues. I am a real estate broker like you, and, and I want to push a couple of things here, if you will give me two or three minutes. I hope that you will take the information you gained from, from this forum today and, and share it with your colleagues. I hope you will tell your colleagues about the ABOR Foundation and the good things that this foundation does. I would venture to say not everybody in our sphere of our colleagues is even aware that there is an ABOR Foundation. I want to push a couple of things. I want you to know that I, I believe as a volunteer servant for you guys that I am very proud of this association. I'm proud of our state association and our national associations. I want you all to know and relate to your colleagues that the Austin Board of Realtors provided disaster relief when Harvey was here. The Texas Association of Realtors reviewed 5,000 applications from the state of Texas for relief, and that the Texas Association of Realtors has dispersed over $3 million in disaster relief to about 3,500 Texans. I want you all to know that your association has the foundation, but one of the main jobs of your association is advocacy, and I'm not going to say this one thing. I'm gonna say we deal with advocacy. And I want to say that I want, I want everybody in this room to know that I've been paying attention. I'm going to repeat two of Ted Heaton's favorite words that he used multiple times. <laughs> And those two words are crap and suck. <laughs> so, part of the advocacy your association does, your state, your local, and your national association, is things about flood insurance, and it's things about tax reform. Earlier this year, we had a call for action about flood insurance. We meet with our elected officials in Washington every year, and I heard time after time after time, that our flood maps are crap and they suck. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, it's really hard to get a good grip 
but there is a flood mapping program that's been used in North Carolina that is expensive, but it's really good. But, but there was a call for action about flood uh, insurance earlier this year. Right now there is a um, call for action going on about tax reform. Please respond to the calls for action. I actually have something right here that talks about the NAR. <laughs> I'm interrupting you because I have something that is hot off the press. I that just the want to say crap and, and, and sucks one more time. <laughs> All right, you did it. You did it. The NAR research shows that if the bill passes in its current uh, form, home values could drop 10% across the country. A drop that significant would negatively impact our clients and our businesses. Thankfully, this is a disaster we can avoid by responding to the call for action. Pull out your cell phones and text the word ACTION to 30644. You'll be sent a link to respond and it takes less than 30 seconds. So again, that's the word ACTION to 30644. Thank you, Bill, for mentioning that. All right. I, again, I want to thank our panelists. And I want to thank our moderator. Um, again, this uh, forum was put on by the Austin Board of Realtors Foundation. Diane mentioned some of the ways that we are funding all of the initiatives that we do, our most worthy citizen luncheon that will be happening this spring. I hope that you come to it. Uh, we just recently had our raffle at Realty Roundup. Of course, the the don't uncheck the box during our dues billing. Another way is we are happy to take um, direct donations on your tables <coughs> or donation cards. If anyone feels compelled to, to give a donation to the foundation today, we would happily accept it. As we mentioned, we are currently doing our our fifth annual Home for the Holidays Blitz build. There are still openings, particularly I think in the last week, which is when the house is all closed in and if it's cold, you're sheltered. If it's hot, you're sheltered. So um, if you can spare a day in your schedule to give a deserving homeowner a new home for the holidays, we would love to have you. It's realtors, affiliates, friends, family. Um, the only requirement is that you have to be 18 years of age. Uh, the build starts at 8 in the morning, and typically it finishes about 3 or 4, and they do want you to stay for the entire day, so it's not sort of a pop-in when you can. So, um, And then the last thing is we are currently doing our um, drive for front steps, helping formerly homeless people transition into permanent housing. It's a small appliance uh, donation. They're being accepted at every one of the three ABOR locations. And I think that's it. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your morning to come learn about things that can help you and your clients. Thank you. There, One there more thing. There are calendars outside if y'all want to grab some. Take yeah. as many as you want. One more thing. These fine gentlemen and women uh, may be sending us additional information that we really would like to get to you. So uh, make sure that you signed in out front so that we know who to send this information to when we get it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Very nice to meet you. Thank 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 you. Th